only announcements really just are uh, the Kids Club on Thursday night at 6 30, and then of course the services on as usual on uh, Sunday as well. And do keep praying for the likes of the warm space as well. Um, I know that the group is there on uh, Monday, and again, that's going to be on every Monday as well, too. So keep them in your prayers. We're going to begin tonight by singing a uh, hymn, and it's going to be on the screen with here being in the, in the other room. Uh, it's, a, it's a video of My Faith is Found a Resting Place. So we're going to sing along with this. It is the tune that you'll be familiar with. The timing might be a little bit different, just to tip you off. Uh, but uh, I'll get Stephen to start that off. I'm going to sing along with it. My faith has found a resting place From guilt my soul is free I trust the ever-living one His wounds for me shall plead I need no other argument I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died that he died for me Enough for me that Jesus saves This ends my fear and doubt A sinful soul, I come to him He'll never cast me out I need no other their argument I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me My heart is leaving Salvation by my Savior's name Salvation through His blood I need no other argument I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died That He died great physician heals the sick the lost he came to save for me his precious blood he shed for me his life he gave I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died that he died for me as well to do that. Pray together. Let's ask for God's help and bless in our prayer together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we to give you thanks, Lord, for the sure foundation in which we can build our faith. That is in Christ Jesus. I want to thank you for the fellowship that we have together in Christ. Lord, that you have called us to yourself. Lord, that you brought us into this, our church family. And Lord, I think me as a church family tonight to pray together, we pray that you will help us as we do that. Help us, Lord, as we turn to your word once again. And Lord, and we <laughs> the truth in our hearts. And Father, just through your spirit, 
apply them even to our lives as well. We do want to give thanks for how your your word does speak in each circumstance of our lives. And Lord, that your word is it's living, it's active, sharp in the night to you, it's sword. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before Christmas, we'd finished First John, and I mentioned that I'd like to finish off uh, two other short letters that John wrote, and we want to do that this evening, but not both of them. We're going to do Second John tonight, and then Third John. I've just realised he's telling me that we're going to block the screen, uh, but we'll work out the logistics of being on here anyway for for next week. We'll get that so maybe, um, and maybe we might need to adjust that or cue maybe adjust the camera or something. I go up to the side, Q. Maybe can I jump that a wee bit? Just see how I get this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see that all right. So before Christmas, we finished first John, and then I mentioned that I want to finish off these other two letters of John rather than us coming back sometime later, the second and third John, while the, the context of that book's in our mind. So just before we read this, let me remind you the context of which John was writing his letters. So John wrote his first letter to a group of house churches, and these were churches that had faced really recent crisis. And that recent crisis was that a group of people had left their number, and we're now denying that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. So this group we were still causing trouble within the house churches, and false teaching was still in danger of being spread. So, so John wrote really his first letter to address that, and he was also in that first letter obviously affirming the gospel and affirming the deity uh, and really the person of Christ. And in his letter there's some themes that we find there. There were three tests really of whether someone was a true believer or not, and there's these three themes are right through First John. And you find them here, and you find them in second and third John as well. The first test was the test of truth, the test of truth and sound doctrine, and then there's the test of obedience. In other words, does someone, if they profess truth, does also their life show it as well? Do they live it out? And then there's the theme of love. So, do they have love for their um, brother and sister in Christ and love for God? But these themes carry over into the second letter as well, too. But before where John was writing to small house churches, a series of them, now the focus narrows in a bit on the one in particular. So it's written to one particular group, and we see that as we read second John together. We're going to read the first one. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the, the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we've worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. For whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope and come to talk to you face to face, that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. We know that God bless the reading. Of his word. You know, it's important for us to understand the seriousness of this situation that John was writing to, because while the gospel was spreading, these house churches were being built up in various places. And by this stage, not many of the original apostles were, were left. It's often thought that actually John would have been um, quite advanced in years at this stage, and he might have even been only one of the, one of the final members of the apostles remaining. Um, but travelling preachers and missionaries were beginning to increase, 
And so while the gospel spread and these house churches spread, so also did false teaching as well. And we see this from the other letters in the New Testament, which often address some element of false teaching that was arising. But John, as we know from the other letter that he wrote, he had a, he's a man with a real pastoral heart. He cares for these believers. He didn't want them to be led, led astray. So that's why he writes this letter. And the first three verses we see his greeting. I'm going to stay here, click on this. So his greeting in the, the first three verses. And the first thing you notice about this is that maybe it's a bit unusual from some of the other letters in the New Testament. The first thing you notice is that John isn't named. And John often does that. He doesn't always give his name in his writings. Um, instead, here he's named as the elder. And that's not so much to do with his age, but rather um, his authority and his relationship to these believers. Elders were the, the, the pastoral leaders in the church, and it was normal for each of the churches to have a number of elders in these house churches. But John, mm -hmm. notice he addresses himself as the elder, not an elder. So he may have had authority over a, a number of, of churches, um, similar to the way if you're uh, reading through the book of Titus, you'll see that Paul charged Titus to appoint elders in a number of the, of the churches. So basically Paul played them in responsibility of as an elder over those churches. So maybe this was the, John was a similar way here. But the second thing that's unusual about the way this book starts is who it's addressed to. It's addressed to the elect lady and her children. Now, there are two opinions on that. And I see a few smiling already in this one. The first says is that John wrote this letter to a Christian woman and her family. And uh, But as you read through the letter, there are a number of reasons why perhaps maybe that might not be the case. First, it's strange that John would write this letter to this woman, um, you know, in, in the church. You know, if she was, you know, maybe it is just actually written to a family. Some say, why, well, you know, maybe this was the case. But if that's the case, then <clears throat> why doesn't John name any of the family? Think of a letter to Philemon. So in there we find actually um, the family's addressed and different people are named. But John doesn't do that. Uh, there also another good reason for why I, mean, I don't personally think this is the case is there's a number of times in the letter where he talks about you and sometimes that's in the singular but in the Greek sometimes it's also in the plural. Have a look down to verse 6. So it says just as you have heard in the beginning that's actually talking about plural that's a plural there that's talking about a group of people. Also in verse 8, that you may not lose what we've worked for. That also is not talking, it's not a singular you. That's talking in plural. It's talking about um, a group. So also, um, so here a group really is what's being addressed. Uh, so the second opinion, which quite a lot of conservative scholars hold to, is that the elect lady and her children is referring then to a local congregation, a house church. Now John we know in his letter is often referred to believers as children. He looks on them. He's now advanced in years and he is looking on them as his dear children. And uh, also even a reason why John might have used this expression, elect lady. Um, the very the very word church in Greek is actually written in, in the feminine sense. And the church, when you think of it, is actually often pictured as bride, that image, the, the, the feminine image of the church as a whole is often used, Ephesians 5, Revelation 19, Revelation 12, there are many references like that. And the church is the elect or the chosen lady because they have been chosen of God. And regardless though, which view you hold to, here's the thing, does it actually matter which of those views? The key surely is the message that John's trying to communicate. Some people might say, well, it's, the, it's addressed to a woman or family. Others might say, no, no, it's addressed to the church. But the key, though, is the message that it communicates, and that's what we're really going to focus our attention on. So notice John's affection for these believers. Look at the second half of verse 1. He loves them in truth, and not just he, but also all who love the truth. See this emphasis in truth? And you'll actually see this multiple times in those first uh, three and four verses. John loves them because they received and accepted the truth of the gospel. And they accept the truth that, and to know the truth. It's not just knowing some facts or doctrine, but this word, to know 
of this world they know the truth has an experiential aspect too they've known it they believe it, and they've committed themselves to it and flowing from all this of course is the fact that they know jesus is the one who is the way the truth and the life the one who john when he finished his first letter in verse 20 um, says he's the true god and eternal life so those who possess this truth john said in verse 2 they'll uh, bide in us and be with us forever you know jesus taught his disciples that he will abide in those who follow him through his spirit and the spirit as he taught them in that upper room of those disciples he said to them the spirit of truth will abide in you forever and John's continuing this thought of abiding in truth. And he said, it's not just this truth will be with us, but verse 3, so will grace, mercy and peace. Grace describing what God has done for us in Christ and how he's given us much more than we ever deserve. God's also given us mercy, not just uh, mercy in the sense that he hasn't given us the judgment that we rightfully deserve through Christ who have been forgiven. And peace as the result that we've obtained through God through faith. In Christ and truth and love. So God is the source of all these blessings and they've come about through Christ. So that partnership of truth and love is important. And you'll see that right throughout this letter. Truth and love is critical because some people can see themselves as holding to the, the truth or defenders of the truth but yet lack love. Others can, can love but yet lack discrimination and who they love. Because I want to expand about what we mean about that in a little while. Because John does caution about exactly who we welcome, even into our, our homes or in their case, a house church. So the greeting is inverted one to three. The next thing we see is an exhortation to walk in love and truth in verses four to six. See, John, it seems, had either met some members of this congregation or he heard about them. Because he said in verse 4, he rejoiced to find that some of your children were walking in the truth, just as God the Father had commanded us to. Now notice the way that's worded in verse 4. Take a close look at that. It says, some of your children. Now that kind of implies, doesn't it, that there were some who weren't walking in God's truth as well. And you see, love and obedience should always go together in the Christian life. That's what John's been getting across in his first letter. And that's why John says in verse 5, we're to love one another. That's something he asks not only of the, of these believers in the church, but he reminds them that this is not a new commandment. Jesus did say actually this, he's talked about a new commandment, but the commandment to love was a very old one actually. Um, it went back to, even in the back in the Old Testament, of course, to love your neighbour. But the command to love was something that these believers had known from the very beginning of their faith. It was something Jesus had taught his disciples as well. Love was to be one of the distinguishing marks. But there was a sense in which Jesus says he gave a new dimension to that commandment to love one another because he set a new standard for it. And the new standard was that they were to love as, as he also loved them and, and also even as the, the love of the Father as well. We're to love as Christ loves. And that's a, that's a high calling, isn't it? To love as Christ loves. This is to be this distinguishing mark of disciples, and it's important for our witness. And he goes on to show, he says, this is love, that we walk according to what God has commanded. And if God has commanded, we should love him. We are to love. This is a command you've heard from the beginning to walk in love. See, we show our love by obeying God's commands. We show we love the Lord by walking in his ways. We can't say we love the Lord and yet live a life of disobedience. You know, truth is not just something that we know and believe. It's something that we need to live out as well. But when John exhorts them to love, he also warns them against loving indiscriminately. Because he warns of the danger they face. Look at the next heading in verses 7 to 11. There's a warning to heed. There's a warning to heed. And underneath that, in verse 7, we see another thing here. The danger, you see, is, is real. The reason why he says you need to walk in truth uh, and love is because there are many deceivers who have gone out into the world. People who delight to lead believers astray. And John says they don't confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. You see, there were some who denied that Jesus came in a real body. 
They, there were some who taught that he only appeared to be human. This false teaching had spread and was right. And in his first letter, John calls such people antichrists. Now, he's not meaning the antichrist spoken of in, in Revelation. But what he's talking about, he's basically saying, if anyone proclaims a false doctrine of Christ, they are anti-Christ. In other words, they are against Christ. And there are many false teachers around in those days. And, you know, they, and they're subtle because they often try and mix elements of the truth. But they mix it with error as well, too. So there are some also who, while they affirm the deity, oh, sorry, the humanity of Jesus, there were others who were also denying Christ's deity. And both are equally dangerous. There was other false teachers even who were trying to entice people by saying we've got some hidden knowledge. And of course, if anyone usually says, you know, to you, I've got a secret, you know, the first thing is, look at the secret is. And people were being led astray like that. Because these false teachers were trying to claim that, ah, there's some hidden knowledge that they needed Jesus and then this hidden knowledge. This was false teaching. It was known as Gnosticism in that day. And so John was saying you need to be, be aware there's deceivers about, but something else. And verses 8 to 11, we say, so be on your guard. So be on your guard. John says in verse 8, watch yourselves so you don't lose what you've worked for in order that you may win a full reward. John and the other apostles had given much time and effort to share the gospel. They'd spread that gospel far and wide. They, they pastorally cared for these believers as well. And yet John didn't want all this work to be lost, he says, so for nothing if you turn aside from the truth. Rather, he wants them to endure, to hold fast to the truth that they've been taught. And other that they gain the eternal reward which God has promised true believers. See, many of these false teachers came enticing people to leave the, the, the basic biblical truths of the gospel. Instead, they were presenting, you know, ah, oh, but here's this other thing you need. And um, these people, they were presenting it as, as new and better. And here was people going on, again, this expression that's talked about here in, in verse uh, 9, everyone who goes ahead. Um, that's because this is how they were trying, the false teachers were trying to portray it. As if here's something new, here's some new insight that you've never seen before. <clears throat> you know, and this was enticing people away from the truth, from the actual truth of God's word. But John is making it clear here. He says everyone who goes on ahead, who, who moves actually away from the gospel, and who moves away from the doctrine of Christ, doesn't abide the teaching of Christ. And as such, they don't have God. They don't have God. Notice John's making it clear in this little phrase. You can't know God without knowing Jesus. You can't just have one without the other. Because Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through him. And it's important. John says we be cautious of such people who proclaim such things. Look at, look at what John says in verse 10 to 11. If anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this uh, um, and brings this teaching, then don't even welcome them into your house. Don't even offer them any greeting at all. You know, here's why it was such a big danger in the culture that uh, John is writing to. So, in the ancient Near Eastern world, hospitality was a, a great virtue. It was hugely important. So if anyone would call around, if there would be any visitors, they would often throw a great uh, banquet and they would, they would give all they can. People would be welcomed into their homes. And in those days, there would be many missionaries and uh, people who would be traveling around spreading the gospel. Many who would be coming to these churches to try and uh, help them. Many of the apostles traveled around as well. These churches, of course, as well. But they were dependent on these, this hospitality to even feed them and house them. But John was saying, be careful. Who you welcome into your home? Nowadays, false teachers don't come in often from your doorstep, but they enter into homes virtually through things we'll watch online or through books that others maybe give us. But the danger is that when one of the false teachers would enter a home, uh, for example, where a house church was, there was a danger that not only would that family be led astray, but the whole house church would. And not only that, but it could spread to some of the other house churches. So John is urging them, don't even welcome these people. Don't even greet them. And what he's getting at there is don't even encourage them in any way. For he says, you ever take part in his wicked work, uh, 
Whoever does this takes part in his wicked works of spreading false doctrine. Now try to think of an example to kind of illustrate this in our sort of modern day terms. Imagine, for example, a scenario where someone from a cult appears on your, your doorstep. You maybe want to speak to them. It's not saying don't speak to them. You want to lovingly correct them. You can, you know, say, well, I don't agree with that, and here's what the Bible says. You can certainly do that. John's not outlining that. Uh, uh, you know, he's not uh, reading that out. But there's a danger in inviting such people into your home. Now, your intention to do that may be to show kindness and maybe so you can have a better conversation with them and try and win them for Christ. But the danger is such people could actually go to another home and say, well, do you know your neighbour there, Mr. Jones, actually invited me in and we had we a real wonderful chat together. And your neighbour doesn't know that you were trying to, you know, correct them. You know, see how that can actually be the means of taking them back to home as well. And John was sort of urging that approach as well. He said, be careful. Be careful you don't even give them a foothold. He wasn't saying don't correct them, don't engage with them. Certainly we can engage with those from the cults who come around the door. Uh, we can correct as well too. Because we, we love them in the sense that we want them to see the actual truth. But then how are we to apply what John is saying? So John isn't saying, he's not saying don't show love and concern for those who hold false doctrine, but we shouldn't encourage them. John was saying don't give them a foothold in the church, to even welcome them into your home may actually indicate unwittingly the others as if you're somehow going along with them. You know, we need great discernment. We know Jesus did indeed eat with sinners. Um, he ate with those he didn't necessarily agree with. He, he dined with tax collectors and sinners. He did so in order to reach them. And, and But this was a very different context. This was a different context. And that in, in the case of Matthew's house, it was a little bit different. But here is a, this is an actual house church. This is being addressed to a place where the people of God will meet. And John was saying, don't let this even take a foothold in your life. You know, welcoming such people may present a danger for the rest of the church community. You know, notice also what John also isn't saying. He's, don't misapply this teaching. He's not simply saying, don't associate with people who, who, um, who have different views with you. Now, some can take us into extremes, because extremes, for other people who are genuine believers, what if those views differ on some matters, secondary matters, for example? Does that mean you don't associate with them? No, John here is talking about, when he talks about the truth at the start, we have to be united with others who are united in the truth. United in matters of primary importance. And what is of primary importance? The gospel is of primary importance. We can happily work with others who are Christians from, from other churches, providing they hold to the, the primary things. Things like the authority of scripture. Things like uh, the person of Christ, um, you know, matters like this as well too, the, or the way of salvation, for example. If someone, uh, you know, if, if we can't really associate with another you know, church if they aren't teaching that you know, salvation is through Christ alone by faith alone, if they try and imply that it's somehow by works, then I'm sorry, that's a make or break issue. We cannot work with them. But if we have we might have differences on secondary issues, things like maybe baptism or you know, maybe even our end times views as well, if they're different. You know, as I was saying on a couple of Sundays ago, people may differ in end times view, but we can agree on the same thing that Christ is returning. We need to, we can unite with others who are united on the primaries, on the primaries, but for secondaries, well, we can exercise free stuff. Agree, they, they disagree. You know, John isn't talking about something like that. He's talking about the false teaching in the house. And you know, what true shepherd would ignore wolves that were near the flock? And that's really the danger that John was facing here. Well, let's look at the very last thing. We see here a longing for fellowship. Paul, you see, had a concern. He had a love for believers. And you can see that here. He says, there's many things I want to say to you, but I'd rather not write them in a letter. Rather, I want to see you face to face so we can talk and so that our joy can be complete. 
you know, face-to-face -face meetings are sometimes often better, aren't they, than, than uh, let, well, I don't want to say letters, but nowadays we don't send letters much. It's more uh, texts or emails, because sometimes texts or emails can be misread, can't it? But, you know, it is good when God people meet together. And so John longed for that too. He longed to meet with them so that their joy would be complete. And he closes with a greeting from another sister church. He says, the children of your elect sister greet you. Do you know, family is important. And while we are a church family, we're also part of a bigger family as well. The children of God, made up of people from every uh, tongue, tribe and nation. And so it's good that we pray for our brothers and sisters too. In the persecuted church, and our sister churches in the association, but also even in the, the churches down the, the road as well to encumber. It's good that we pray for one another. Fellowship among believers here, united in the truth and love, is a beautiful and a precious thing. The truth matters, and so does love. So let us hold the both. You know, as we close, Mark Dever notes how the, the first part of this letter he says is maybe it seems nicer than the second. Because the first said, love one another. But the second says, don't even let a false teacher into your home or welcome them. But he says both are closely related because Christianity, real Christianity, involves love and truth. He writes, teachers of truth who live loveless lives will find that people reject their truth and truth will not be served. Teachers of untruth, no matter how loving they might appear, can destroy lives and love will not be served. We need the truth. But we need to love them well, and we need to hold both together. May God help us to do that. To love also with the sermon, to hold the truth, to extend also love as well. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks, God, for your goodness towards us and for this word that you have given, Lord. And help us, Lord, to love with the sermon, to love the right things. Father, we want to give thanks for opportunities that we've had to work with other like-minded evangelical churches in our community. And Lord, help us as we continue to do that. We give thanks that we can be united in the primary things with them. And Father, just help us as we do seek to work together. And Lord, help us also to be on our guard as well, forever as well. Even the things that we watch online or the things that we read. But help us to love the truth to know the truth, and to live the truth. Father, help us now as we pray together. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.